Last time on World War K, our brave Kerbals were transporting some totally humanitarian, totally not weapons, supplies when they were attacked by the machine menace known as Mechjeb. A state-of-the-art bomber was tasked with destroying them, however, it failed. Moreover, we discovered that Belby Kerman from the initial attack had survived and was now hostage. Oh, and we crashed the brand new bomber. Now, the continuation. Hello, I'm Interlithium. So, uh, getting right down to it, the plan is to make an A-10 Thunderbolt 2, otherwise known as the Warthog. Um, I might call it a Thunderbolt or a Warthog at the same time. I flip between the two. Uh, colloquially, it's known as the Warthog. Actually, it should be called the Thunderbolt, but eh. Anyway, what it is, is it's close air support plane, if you don't know. It's basically built around the idea of have a gigantic Gatling cannon at the front, and that's pretty much what it's famous for. I want to build our version though with two Gatling cannons, because we can. So I'm going to try and put these two on and make sure they can somehow sort of not spread the fire. Like, yeah, this this is currently... We're going to hit two different targets if we're really clever, or most of the time just miss completely. So let's try this again. Um, I'm trying to think of a way we can actually get these together. And I think the probably the easiest way is not to actually use the cockpit. Because you get like five degree increments of turning and the cockpit isn't that. So instead, and you know, this is a really good tip by the way. If you're having that problem, use part clipping, right? So now we've got two part clipped attached to a girder inside. And they should fire directly forwards. Now of course the A-10 Warthog only has one. Uh, Gatling cannon. It's, it's a 30 millimeter Gatling cannon. Don't get me wrong. It's not bad. And you know the plane has to be pretty much designed around it. And this Gatling cannon is a it's, it's a Gau 8, 30 millimeter Gatling cannon. It fires depleted uranium rounds. It's designed to take out tanks, and it can penetrate something like seven centimeters of armor from a distance of 500 meters. So you're not talking a pea shooter. Now of course you know it has you know limited ammo, but you still have about I think about 20 seconds worth of ammo if you fire you know you know continuously. Not that you would, because you'd, you know, ruin the barrel and you'd have to replace the barrel pretty damn soon. But the, the A-10 Warthog was pretty much designed about 40 years ago to be a close-in weapon system to really support ground troops. The whole sort of combined arms tactic is to really have your, your forces working together. And a great way to support ground troops is with air force. And if you've got enough air power, then sure, go ahead. And the problem is that with fighters of the day back then, fighters were going a little bit too fast. And it made it hard to hit, you know, slow moving targets. If you're in a fighter going at 300 miles an hour and you want to shoot a tank going 15, you're going to have a very minimal amount of time on target to be able to shoot it. Now, of course, these days you'd have guided weapons, but there are still some issues in, you know, you can jam guided weapons, etc. Or you can use, you know, good foliage or whatever, da 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 So, to a certain extent, you know, having a giant Gatling cannon from a slow-moving object really actually gives you an advantage. And that's what the, the, uh, the Warthog was really designed around. Being slow-moving, being maneuverable at slow speeds, and that's weird because normally you expect, oh, high speeds is good. No, not really. Now, in this case, you do want it slow, and that means, oh, well, you know, they'll get able to shoot you better, and, you know, you'll, you'll suffer damage and stuff, and obviously this will be terrible. But actually, the, the Warthog is really designed about being incredibly resilient. The Warthog is made of some sort of complicated hexagon structure in its wings to mean that they, they structurally stay sound even when they're damaged, and it can fly with an engine out, it can fly with a tailplane out and a missing part of a wing, and it will still fly. And the, the person in the actual cockpit, the pilot, is protected by what is effectively known as a bathtub made of titanium and weighs over half a ton. And this should protect the, the pilot from pretty much anything. So the problem we're having in KSP with this is, of course, the engines on the back there, they're a little bit maybe further up on the Warthog itself in our version, a little bit further down. Now the problem is because they're mounted above the center of mass, I've had to tip them down to try and point through the center of mass. Because in KSP, especially the stock drag model, if you have an engine above the center of mass, it will push you down. And I'm trying to pull up here and you see we're having some issues taking off. Which isn't great. Now you can solve this, you can have the engines pointing through the center of mass, and even though it looks stupid, it would work. The problem is it's kind of hard to get perfect. And we're trying to take off, we're just bouncing a lot. The end of the runway helps, but um... This is me pulling full back on the stick. And let go. No. Pull back on the stick. Pull back on the stick. Pull back. On, we're not even gaining height. Now, now, now we're losing height. Now we're below 80. We're falling fast. We are falling fast. I am glad I've got an eject system. We're going to have to use it. And boom. Well, that was expensive. 
Hmm. Yeah. Now, let's try again. And uh, I'm going to hope that we now you see the engine's pointing a bit more down. I'm still trying to pull up, and we're doing a little bit better. We're actually climbing, but at such an insignificant rate. This is me full back on the stick. This will be like the world's biggest loop. And I let go, and suddenly we're pointing downwards. Pull up, pull up, pull up. Let's try and pull up again. Come on, pull up, pull up, pull up, pull up. Pull up. We're going to have to We're gonna have to eject. We're not going to make this. We need to eject. I like the HUD, by the way. Having the... Uh, whoop. There we go. Uh, having the velocity vector mark does show us that, yeah, we are totally going to crash. I like that. That's a very nice feature. Okay. Try again. Right. This time, you can see I've just moved the engines down further down the side and point them even further down a little bit. Hopefully, it's a work. It looks less like the ATM Warthog now with the engines very much on the side of the craft as opposed to sort of halfway up the side, halfway on top. And try and take off as fast as possible. Ooh, ooh, we actually took off. And this is me pulling full back. Let go. Ooh, pull full back. Full back. Well, it's better than before. It, I think it will do. Let's let's try and simulate a little bit of a flight. Have a little fly around. Maybe then dump some fuel and then try and land it with less fuel. Because I need to simulate the fact that it will be run out of fuel. Because that alters your center of balance. And when that happens, you can have weird things happen. So let's try and do that probably a fairly good idea. But the, the advantage to actually having your uh, engines above the craft, like certainly one of the advantages on the uh, the A-10, on the Warthog itself, is that it actually means that stuff that's on the runway or near nearby doesn't get kicked up into the engine as easily. Now, if you had your engines under sun under the wings or, you know, far forwards front on the, the fuselage, there's a little bit more chance of that happening. And the A-10 was really designed. It was very much, I, I like the design of being resilient, having redundancy, able to be easily repaired, and being able to operate from a forward operating base. So, in effect, you could you know, have a, a rough sort of airfield that you've made or you've, you've sort of got from, I don't know, a suitable piece of road or something. And you could start using it as a, a place to, you know, have A-10s provide close air support around where you wouldn't really be able to land anything else. Which, you know, is pretty useful. There we go, beautiful. Now, it must be pointed out that when the, uh, the actual real A-10 fires its main weapon, it actually loses a few miles per hour speed because of the uh, the ridiculous amount of muzzle velocity and the ridiculous shells that the depleted uranium Gatling cannon takes. These shells are about 30 centimeters long. That's a foot for those of you who don't know how long 30 centimeters are. And they weigh over two-thirds of a kilo each. Yeah. And this thing fires almost 4,000 rounds per minute. They're something to behold. So I've also equipped her with a couple of uh, Hellfire rockets. The, the A-10 is perfectly able of mounting some actual ordnance as well. I mean, the A-10 can actually carry bombs if it wanted, but it very rarely does. I mean, a standard loadout on the A-10 tends to include an ECM pod and maybe a couple of anti-air missiles just in case. And while it may be designed entirely around the Gatling cannon, it more these days does carry guided missiles because of the ability to just stand off and fire them. And turning is very slow. And I'm watching my velocity vector being like, yep, that's that's a hill. Ugh. Turning is very slow. Hmm. I think to make this better, we should have just had more wings. I'm going to leave it as it is, I think. it's It operates. It looks like the A-10, which really fulfills my criteria. But more wings would certainly help. More lift force, more, you know, ability to turn, catch the air. Hmm. Anyway, let's start dumping some fuel and simulate the, the fact that, you know, we're coming back from a mission and we're maybe a bit fuel light. And we fired off our rockets, so we're now payload light as well. We fired off a bit of our ammunition. Pretty good. I want to make sure I keep some fuel. Got to not let that run out. That would be bad. And it also, by doing this, we can check that the fuel is actually flowing correctly. Seems okay. All right. Just coming to land, and we'll we'll need to go a bit to the left, I think. Now, the problem is, of course, because we've got this horrible turning circle, which I dislike. That's not like the A-10. The A-10's actually fairly nippy uh, in terms of its, you know, ability to maneuver at uh, low speeds and low altitudes. We aren't. And it's going to be really annoying trying to come back through our strafing pass, because we're going to have to turn around for several kilometers, which is going to be frustrating, to say the least. Okay, let's try come on over a bit to the left. It seems to be handling fine in terms of the uh, the lack of fuel now. I was expecting it to sort of have some really weird wobble, and especially since we were only just pitching up, I was expecting it to like not pitch up at all or something. It's actually pitching up fine. I don't think there's any real noticeable difference it's handling at low fuel, which, you know, 
isn't great because it acts pretty poorly anyway, but if at least it isn't any worse. We are fairly low and fairly slow. I think we might need to engage the engines in a second if we uh, don't speed up. Hmm. We're doing okay for glide. Not great, but okay. Although, look at that angle of attack. We're up like 15 degrees and we're only just getting our velocity vector on the horizon. Mm, ooh, ooh. I don't think we're going to make it. The lip on the runway is going to catch us. We need to kick in the engine slightly. Come on. That's better. And try to pull a bit over to the left. Come on, left. There we go. Velocity vector is on the runway. We can turn the engine down and we can try and settle. I think we'll be good here. There we go. And yeah, the, a the A10 is of course designed around having a fairly short takeoff and landing. Not ridiculously short, but a fairly short so it can operate from those forward operating bases I mentioned. And it looks like we aren't doing too badly on the takeoff and the landing is... Well, it could certainly be faster if we had better brakes, but... Eh. I guess it dems the brakes. I hate myself. And we can also propel ourselves backwards for taxiing using our cannon. Although that's probably not recommended. The Kerbals are probably going to have to complain about the state of the runway now. Hmm. Anyway, we are now at the target area. I did the flying off camera because it's a long way to fly. Um, lovely cloud layer. I was having some real problems at altitude of actually keeping this thing up. Um, you know the whole, oh, it's very hard to actually pitch upwards. And when you get to high altitude, it just doesn't pitch up at all and you end up sort of falling out of the air. It's weird. Anyway, I've inverted now so that we can uh, pull down and around. And ooh, starting to pull a little bit. I'm going to wait until we're, we're sort of coming in over the sea for our first strafing run. For this loadout, I've equipped two Hellfires and two bombs. I could have equipped more missiles or more bombs, but I decided to keep a bit of a varied payload. I didn't want to go with anything too powerful, um, especially, you know, I was a bit concerned about the weight, uh, but mainly because I want to actually show off the, the A-10 uh, having its, you know, ridiculously awesome 30mm Gatling cannon. That's really what it's built around. That's really what I want to test out on these armoured tanks. It's what it's designed to fight against. So we'll use the Gatling Cannon and the missiles and the bombs are there really as just backup. Uh, I don't expect to have to use them, but if we do, then, you know, cool. So we've got just the Hellfires. Short range, not too explosive-y, but, you know, they're nippy. They can manoeuvre fairly well, should be able to hit the target. And the bombs, which, well, we proved last time that carpet bombing was pretty awful. Maybe with a sort of a nice low and slow approach, maybe these will work. Now these bombs are Snake Eye Bombs, so they will be, you know, you can drop them at a low altitude and they will slow themselves down with these little deployable grid thins that slow their descent. So, should we go to the target? A bit of acceleration. This has been a fairly slow uh, approach. Now, planning to use the in-cockpit uh, view to be able to get a shot. It's just a little bit easier seeing in cockpit, especially when you zoom forwards. Alright. Let's start shooting. Uh, bring the reticle down. The problem is it's so not maneuverable and lacks SAS that I'm actually having a hard time bringing the, the maneuver node on target, especially considering the velocity vector is very low. Let's give us a few pops. Come on. There we go. A few bursts in. Should have plenty of rounds to continue doing this for a little while. But def difficulty keeping this thing on target. I'm trying not to hit Bilby. I'm aware Bilby's directly in front of where I'm firing. It should all be on target. Well, not all of the bullets, but the burst. Ooh, ooh, glad I noticed a pull up there. Wow, I didn't think we were so... Ooh, we could have hit the remains of the uh, the rover. Ooh, all right. Well, let's come in for a second run. When I'm in cockpit view, I do actually have the, the HUD... Um, I don't know what you call it. The, the flight control HUD or the flight data HUD or something. I can't remember the mod's called. Uh, which allows you to see, you know, currently it's down there by the side of the, the, uh, the nav ball. You can see it says altitude. And when you're in the cockpit view, it says at the top of the screen. Very helpful because I need to know when I'm about to crash into the ground. It saved my life there. So let's get a few bursts in here. I feel a bit more confident about this run. A little bit slower, a little bit lower. I'm liking it. Especially for the fact we're not going up to a hill where we're going to, you know, hit the hill if we don't pull up. Just got to make sure we don't lose too much altitude where I'm doing this. Because the problem is because we're not... Like, you see our velocity effect is falling so quickly. As soon as we're strafing, we're having to pull up. And I think this is a big problem, is because as soon as we strafe, we have to pull up. Now, those did look like they were some pretty good shots on target. Let's, uh... Give it a bombing run now. It doesn't look like they've been too damaged. I haven't seen, you know, amazing, like, crazy explosions or anything coming off them. But it did look like we got the, the shots on target. So let's try the bombs as well. 
you know, but the, the you can see here, I'm having to constantly pull up. If I was trying to aim here with the uh, the reticules for the actual guns, really difficult. I think that's the main issue with this is I'm trying to glide. Ooh, drop bomb. And did we get a hit? That looked really close. One, two. Oh, the first one was slightly short. The second one was slightly long, but so close. No da- None! None! You have to be kidding. What? Okay, we're doing Hellfire. We are doing the Hellfire missiles. Those missiles- Those bombs were so close, and we, they seem to have no damage from my Gatling cannon. What? I could have sworn I got hit. I could have sworn I got hit. I think the software is bugged. I think, you know, the, the, the hardware maybe is bugged as well. Maybe, you know, the explosions are just confetti. Alright, well, we're in range of the missiles. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to lock a different target, so we've got one target for each missile. Don't want to waste our missiles by firing them both at one target. We've got three targets to take down, only two missiles. Both of them got... hits? That looks like a... What? I could have sworn we hit the target! Okay, next next one, come on. This is it. Final, final run. Chuck Kerman, you've got a plan. You're a brave soul. Let's let this thing come on, Velocity Vector. That looks good, that's good. Bail, bail, bail! Short of the explosion, but... Ooh, the debris went through? Oh, if the debris went through, it must have gone straight through the target. What? Oh, explosions! Maybe we... Is that... Did we kill it? Did we kill it? Did we kill it? What? There's, there doesn't seem to be any damage. And now they've got Chuck and Bilby. What? No! No! I can't believe we've failed again! That- we got good hits that time. What is wrong? No! Well, at least part of us survived. I don't know why they're not taking damage. We definitely got like good hits there. Um I'm I'm so confused. I don't know. What are we gonna do next time? Bring bring something bigger. Anyway, if you like the episode, well, like, and if you're not subscribed, well, you know, please consider subscribing. And hopefully next time we will destroy some bleeding tanks. Stay shiny.